Sure. So, thank you everyone for attending um, and thank you for your interest in this seminar. Uh, we're very pleased to have Fiona Deering to run this session for us. Um, Fiona's been a coach for more than 20 years and a long time supporter of Pony Club and the broader horse industry. Fiona's also been a great resource for us in um, assessing bits and formulating the national gear rules as they relate to bits uh, because of Fiona's expertise and her understanding that the difference that a better bit can make for the horse and of course with Pony Club Australia putting such emphasis on horse welfare and rider safety we know that both of those things go together. It can be a very confusing area though with a lot of people with a lot of products, a lot of old products, a lot of new products and it's often hard to discern um, what the best choice is for your horse and so we're very fortunate to have Fiona with her expertise and her business and her familiarity with Pony Club to um, give us a session tonight. So over to you, Fiona. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Um, as Catherine mentioned, my background has been a riding coach over the last 20 years or so. The last six, seven years, I've also been involved in transitioning standard breads into their life after racing. Um, and look, I'm the first to admit that when that occurred, I put the bit on that I had laying around and seemed to work okay. Um, I recently turned 50, so that gives you a bit of an idea of how old um, or the era was when I went to Pony Club. And, you know, there weren't bit fitters back there then, and, you know, there weren't even saddle fitters. I mean, the, the difference between a good fitting saddle and a bad fitting saddle when I went to Pony Club was two towels. And if you got one of those white foam riser pads, you were really fancy. I didn't have a white rope white um, foam riser pad that's for sure so bit choices at that point you know my memories are of a full cheek snaffle an egg butt a loose ring you know mainly single jointed some were double jointed um they were always stainless steel that was sort of the only material we had to choose from at the time as a as a general rule and if you needed something for fast work you you had a pelham or a dutch gag to choose from that was sort of it um, so it's safe to say there have been some changes since then uh, nearly two years ago I commenced studying to be a bit fitter and to say that my eyes were opened was a bit of an understatement um, and look that's not to say that I you know I don't think I'd bit, bitted my horses certainly not cruelly um, and I certainly hadn't used super strong bits, but I wasn't putting bits in their mouths that were sympathetic to them as an individual, um, to their level of training, to their past history as, as racehorses, and to their mouth anatomy. But, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And I now see many horses each week who are bitted I guess, as we'd say, incorrectly, which is, makes it sound a little more harsh than what it is, really. Um, and it's amazingly gratifying to see their owners genuinely blown away by the change in their feel and the horse's reaction to their aids when we change the bit. And that's also to say, you know, there's never any judgment on my part from that, because as I said, you don't know what you don't know. And the most important thing is, is that they've reached out and said, I think I need to make a change here. And, you know, truth be told, I was there myself not so long ago. In terms of the types of horses I bit, obviously I do a lot of um, pony club horses, adult riding club horses, pleasure horses, through to high performance horses, um, and race horses and I guess what I've found most surprising is uh, in terms of race horses I've largely bitted harness racing horses over thoroughbreds which I find I mean I have a bit of background and contacts within the harness racing industry but it's um, it's still interesting that though that is the industry that reaches out more than thoroughbreds. Um, so, look, as, as you'd all know the bit has been part of our tack kit since Viking times and that 
basic design of a cheek piece and a mouthpiece hasn't changed hugely since then. What has changed in more recent years is our understanding of how the pressures in the horse's mouth work um, and now how we can fit to suit individual horses, individual disciplines and horse and rider combinations. Um, so today, I well tonight, <laughs> it's evening, I really do want to talk about the hows and whys of bitting. Um, I'll answer some of the most common questions I receive about bitting. And we'll also cover some information about different materials, mouthpieces, cheek pieces, how they work in horses' mouths, mouths and how they contribute towards choosing safe and appropriate bitting options for a horse and rider combination, which is something I've been really passionate about, is making sure the horse and rider are bitted as a combination, not as individuals. Um, and you'll notice that Pony Club Australia have um, popped up some posts earlier in the week about some bitting myths and so I'll hopefully explain those too. Now we've closed off commenting for now um, but we will open that up towards the end of the presentation so if you have things you feel that you aren't clear or you've got specific queries about just jot a note down and pop it up at the end and you know obviously I don't know everything there is to know on this topic so if you do pop up a question that I'm like, yeah, good question. Um, I'm more than happy to um, do some research and get back to you. And if you think of questions afterwards, um, you're more than happy. You're more than welcome to contact me through my Bitwright, Bitwright Equine Facebook page, um, regardless of where you are in Australia. So I'm actually based in Gordon near Ballarat. Um, coldest place in the world? Well, not quite, but certainly one of the coldest places in Victoria. Um, and I service most of Western, Central and Northern Victoria. So before we start in detail, I want you to just draw your attention to a really good post that Pony Club Australia put up yesterday, Monday. Yes, yesterday was Monday. And I'll just read it out. Just because you've always done something a particular way doesn't mean you always have to. Changing how you do something doesn't mean you were wrong. It just means that you learned more. That's why it's okay to say, I used to teach train like this. Sometimes change can be hard and that's how we all get better at what we do. And we all want to do the best for our horses. So I think that really sums up the change in bitting, particularly over the last 10 years or so. So let's quickly whip through some bitless um, bitting bitting materials. Um, ye olde stainless steel is something that everyone would be familiar with. So these are some old style stainless steel bits. Um, you know, in configurations, you would have been familiar with the old full cheek snaffle. And, you know, the stainless steel as a material has been the mainstay of bitting for, you know, since they moved from iron, really. Um, it's cheap it lasts a massively long time like your grandchildren's grandchildren can run this under some water and pop it in the horse's mouth and it will still be functional um, but it's not the greatest horses don't really like it it's hard it's cold it's heavy um, and a lot of horses really don't like it in and, and these are old style bits. So you can see the diameter of that bit is, is quite something as well. So one of the bitting myths that we put up is that, you know, it's okay to use the bit that grandpa used to use. Um, and these are probably some of the examples of that. Um, and look, it probably is fine in terms of, you can pop it into a horse's mouth and this will be functional. Um, what I'm pretty sure it won't be is sympathetic to the horse's particular mouth and taking into account more recent learnings we have about bitting and mouth conversation. So, you know, it, yes, it's going to have functionality. Yes, it's going to stop your horse. Yes, it's going to turn your horse, but it's not really going to help your horse be a better athlete. So the more recent materials that we've been um, able to source, are things like the copper alloys that Noah Schull and Spranger have. 
And these, um, you know, they're the goldy coloured bits. So they're designed to be, um, create more bit acceptance. So a copper alloy is lighter, it's warm, and it's a really good con um, conductor of heat. So once they get it in their mouth, it comes up to body temperature really quick and it stays there. Stainless steel is a really poor conductor of, um, of heat. Um, and they're soft. When I say soft, you'll see these bits become marked up. Um, the teeth can, can make a mark on it. And that doesn't mean they're going to chew through them. You know, you're going to, yes, you always need to care for the joints of your bits and make sure they're clean and, and not wearing. But, you know, for the level of riding most of our riders do, these are going to last an incredibly long time. Um, and the fact that they're warm and soft and they taste a little bit sweet means that it, um, it is accepted in the horse's mouth. The horse gets it in its mouth. It likes it. It's, it's not invasive to their mouth. And so then they forget it's there until we need to use it. So that's the cop copper alloys and that's the newer shawls and the springers and that style of bit. Um, we then have the sweet irons, which I've got two here, and I'm not 100% sure whether you'll be able to see the difference. My lighting is not super. But you'll see the one at the top is a bright blue, um, and the bot one at the bottom is slightly more dull. Now, these are, um, are a stainless steel bit, but they are um, heat-treated to have this sweet iron and what that and that and the reason why a blue it's just the way it's heat treated so bits like bombers and trust that come in sweet iron and there are a few other brands around um, the oxidization that occurs once the steel's in the horse's mouth means that it tastes really nice and sweet some horses love it um, they will not remain that bright blue color I have quite a few people go oh my bits changed color that's exactly what it's meant to do because it oxidizes so if you leave them out in the rain um, or don't use them for quite a while you'll find that they look quite rusty it's the rust that tastes sweet that the horses like so just in terms of care of these bits if they do get really rusty and you feel like they're a little bit bubbly just a little bit of wet and dry sandpaper just flat, flattens that out and makes the bit nice and useful again the other, um, now there are still stainless steel bits made and there are still generic stainless steel bits that are like the ones I held up before. Um, this is a mylar bit and you can see that the stainless steel is much um, narrower. So this is just on the diameter level of, of what you can use in Pony Club of 10 mil. They have copper inlays to increase um, bit acceptance and salivation. But the reason these are, are quite acceptable to a horse is they don't take up a lot of space in the horse's mouth. And because the stainless steel isn't such a solid lump of metal, it, it does retain heat a little bit better than those large canoes, as I like to refer to them. Um, and then we've got our synthetic materials. So nylons, um, things on my dining table. Um, this is a trust flexi soft um, that has a lot of movement in it. These are great for horses that are very adverse to metal. They don't like metal in their mouth. Um, and um, bombers also do a range that are a little more solid, um, but it's a nylon material. So it's not the metal feel in their mouth and on their teeth. Now, um, these are still legal because they have a metal core through them so that um, and obviously they're not recommended for horses that chew on bits because they are just going to chew through the material but horses that are nice and soft on bits a lot of them really like these and it's interesting you see a lot of these um, particularly these trust bits and there's um, another brand which escapes me at the moment but they use them a lot on the very high level show jumpers so they're obviously um, you know a little bit fussy in the mouth not wanting so much metal and or movement as well, because this is a nice even pressure in the horse's mouth. So um, that sort of covers the, the materials. Um, so the next question I you know, have a lot is, 
why should I have my horse bit fitted? And really, it's a fair question. Um, you know, if you've got a horse that's in something and they steer and stop, okay, you know, why should you change? Um, the easiest thing I do is compare it to shoes. So we don't all wear the same shoes. Some of us have got high arches, some of us have got low arches, some of us have got wide feet, some of us have got narrow feet. Um, and there are sizes and styles and fits to complement all of our fit, feet in terms of that. Um, if we wear a pair of shoes that isn't a great fit for us, we get a blister, we get a sore back, we, you know, we, we change the shoes. Horses' mouths are also, well, not quite like our feet, but you get the analogy. Um, they're, you know, they're different by breed and by horse. Um, it's a space where there's an incredible concentration of nerves and it's a highly sensitive area. So bits apply pressure in different places in the mouth. And the three main points of pressure are the tongue, the bars, which is the space between the premolars and the incisors, and the lips. We also consider the chin and the pole as points of pressure. But obviously that's when we're discussing bits like pelons or leverage bits and weymouths that, that directly apply pressure to those points. So think about how sensitive your horse's lips are. You know, they use their lips to sift through food. They use their tongue to move the food from their incisors up to their molars to be ground. And then think about how incredibly tolerant these animals are to allow us to do what we do with them. So their behaviour is the only way they have to show us that they're not comfortable. Um, and some of the behaviours we see when a horse is not comfortable in his mouth is tongue activity is obviously the main one, um, throwing of their head, evasion of the bit by trying to lift their head up or pull their head pull board down on the hands. And all of those, you know, you've all seen these sorts of evasions. Um, our own, you know, when we are, our own tongue gets bitten, it gives you some idea of how sensitive a horse's tongue is and then we put you know metal in there and um it's it's a lot their bars are particularly sensitive so the bars i'll just grab my skull um this is scully so the bars are this space between the premolar and the incisors scully's missing a few incisors um, but this space is particularly sensitive. Um, it is pretty much like the bridge of our nose. And that means that it's skin pulled over bone. So all of the nerves are really, really close to the surface. So when you see a horse, and look, the, the prime examples are the thoroughbreds off the track as a general rule with the head flicking. Um, you know, that metal's coming down on somewhere that's that sensitive. So if you hit yourself in the back of your thigh, you know, you don't think much of it because you've got muscle and fat um, padding that space between the skin and the bone and the nerve, nerves sitting there. Here, if you hit yourself that hard there, you, your eyes would water. So that's kind of a really good guide of where, you know, how sensitive those bars are. Um, the other thing in terms of tongue pressure on a horse, um, I haven't, um, I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to see or go to a, a dissection and obviously it's not for everyone, but the tongue sits a long, long way up in um, between the T and, between the T and J on them. So the tongue finishes you know, up here somewhere. Um, and it sits on a little apparatus called the hyoid. The hyoid, when it's restricted or when that tongue is pulled up and back, is the start of a facial chain that goes all the way through the horse. And when you go to a um, dissection, what they'll often do is compress the hyoid or put a lot of tongue pressure down. And then they'll ask you to move the back leg. And it's literally like moving it through half dried cement. So again, if that tongue isn't relaxed, the horse cannot move through its body as effectively as we would like it to. So this brings us to the next bitting myth around the thicker the bit is being the kinder, being the kindest way. You know, if we've got a nice thick bit, it's super kind to the horse. 
And it's really not true. I went to a betting um, consult with a lovely girl who had a thoroughbred mare who was about 15, 15, one hand tall, only little. And she said, it's really weird. I can always see her teeth. I went, oh, okay, show me what you're using. And she presented me with this. And this measures six inches wide for a star. Um, this is a proper canoe. And from memory, I think I did the diameter of it. It was about 30 mil. A horse's interdental space, where the space that it has for the bit to sit is between 14 and 17 mil or so, obviously depending on whether it's a pony or a large horse and, and the breed, but that's sort of roughly the, the guide. Um, and it does obviously depend on the individual's horse's tongue and the size of its skull and stuff. Um, so 30 mil of this, and the only redeeming feature of this bit is that it actually is hollow, so it doesn't weigh 10 kilos. Um, she couldn't close her mouth around that bit. So we need to have um, bits that are, are better made than this. I mean, this, this probably was grandpa's bit. This is, uh, this is a monster. I love it. It's fantastic. Um, but, um, you know, certainly not suitable for, for her and her horse ended up going into a nice double jointed D-ring bit that was correctly fitted and happy as a clam. So the kindest bit for a horse is one that's well suited to their mouth conformation and the style and level of work they're doing and the combination of horse and rider. So the next question I often get is how often should my horse be bit fitted? Um, and that's another of the myths we spoke about is should my horse remain in the same bit for its entire ridden career? And the answer to that is, well, yes and no. So not really an answer. Um, let's have a look at two examples. There's the pony club pony who's taught the whole family to ride and he's moved on to the next family in pony club and he's just going to stay around that pony club around that same level all his life. And it will be probably a relatively low level. Um, he's probably going to need one bit correctly fitted to him and that will do him for all of his ridden life. The next example is the horse that may start with a combination at a lower level and they might go through all the way through pony club ranks to, to grade one. That combination may well need more than one bit fitting during their career because they are performing higher work having more demanding questions asked of them of as a combination. And so they may need a more refined communication tool to do that as they move up the levels. So, you know, the short answer is that probably three quarters of the horses I see only require one bit fitting. And another 25% that are those sort of high performance horses or horses moving through different levels um, would need more than one fitting. But again, it might be two years between fittings. So it's not like saddle fitting where, you know, if your horse drops muscle or puts on muscle or changes shape, changes weight, you know, that's when you need to maybe look at your, sad, your saddle being tweaked. You know, um, not a whole lot goes on, is affected in the mouth by those external changes, um, except the level of work that they're doing. So, one thing I'm quite passionate about is that I really want to have a combination correctly fitted. So when we look at, say, a genuine grade five or six rider who's on a pony, like the pony we mentioned before, it might have taught lots of kids to ride. Um, and look, I'm, I'm making assumptions, but as a grade five or six rider, we would expect that child to be unsteady in their seat and hand. So, you know, some point they're going to be needing maybe their reins for balance. Um, and depending on their age, they may just be distracted by the shiny thing. And, you know, those little tiny tots, you know, are easily distracted. Um, for that combination, I always recommend a fixed check piece bit. So let's just deviate for a second, talk about check pieces and mouth pieces. Obviously, a fixed check piece is your egg butts, um, your D rings, anything that's not a loose ring. And the reason why I prefer a fixed check piece, I'm just trying to find a loose one here, for a um, lower level combination 
is a fixed check piece gives the mouth piece. So obviously what's in the mouth is the mouth piece. What's on the outside of the mouth is the check piece. It gives a fixed check piece gives the mouth piece more stability. So you can already see with that loose ring mouth piece, there's a lot of movement as I move them up and down compared to the fixed check piece. So we want to stabilize, a, you know, a fixed check piece really works as a little bit of a shock absorber um, between our hands and the horse's mouth. So beginner combinations, um, um, older kids may be going on to their first larger horse where that movement might be bigger and make them unstable a little bit. Also, I recommend going back into a fixed cheek piece for a little bit. Also helps, um, you know, D-rings and things like that help with a little bit of um, helping ponies turn that might be a little bit reluctant to toe the line. Um, I'm not a massive fan of the full cheek bit, um, this sort of thing, just because it gets caught on stuff. Um, it gets caught in bandages, it gets caught on your butt, um, horses, ponies, horses and ponies rub on it. We have more, I, I feel that we have more elegant designs in terms of D-rings and things that are a little safer for everyone. I've seen a horse get caught in gear with one of these once and it wasn't a great look and it wasn't a great ending. So I'm a little bit risk adver averse to those. Um, so yeah, with that lower level rider, even someone going up onto a larger horse that might be a schoolmaster, even then just to protect the horse's mouth. I often joke that, you know, if I had a client who won Powerball and rang me up and said they bought Vallegro and they're very excited about buying Vallegro, he would go into a fixed cheek piece bit while they learned to be stable on him to protect his mouth. Um, so as the rider starts to develop an independent hand and seat, we then maybe start to look at changing our bitting. Now, obviously, if the combination is still happy and working well in a fixed cheek piece bit, there's no reason to, you know, no reason to change. But if the combination were, if, if the rider was feeling like perhaps their aids were a little bit dull or the response wasn't quite as quick as they'd like, um, and they were competing at say a grade three level where there is an assumption that the rider has developed an independent hand and seat and they're asked for things like sitting trot, etc. cetera, um, then we would look at perhaps if they were in a well-fitting um, mouthpiece, we would just change that bit to be a loose ring so that they then have that quicker on-off aid um, and the mouthpiece becomes a little more lively in the horse's mouth. So there's a little bit more, um, look, I, I kind of think of it as, as noise, but correct noise, if you like. Um, so they do, you know, you can and give a much more finely tuned aid. Now, when we start to look at these riders moving into competitive jumping disciplines, um, particularly around that grade three level and the um, older teenagers, we do tend to see a lot of riders um, finding that their horses have got a little bit strong and they want some more breaks on that. Now, I am, once again, a little bit old fashioned in that, and I want the training to come first before we start to bit up. I purposely really feel uncomfortable and, and often won't bit up a combination that is grade four, that is struggling with control and cross, cross country as an example, because I feel that as a General rule, and this is not taking in special consideration circumstances, but as a general rule, that is a training issue. Um, and my priority is keeping both horse and rider safe. They have to be safe. Um, often kids at that level, you know, those 15, 16 year olds really want to be out competing. They've often got their first or second larger horse that might be a bit sharper with those sorts of um, disciplines. And I've, as a coach, 
I've seen it over the years of kids coming into Pony Club Rally after rally with a bit more gear, a bit more gear, a bit more gear. And really, as a coach, I want them to take that off and go back and train for six months. But they want to be out competing. And look, it's a really hard thing to juggle and it's a hard conversation to have. But I feel for a safety level, it has to be a conversation that goes between the child, the parent and their existing coach. Um, so yeah it, it is a it is a tricky one to go but that said if we are going to look at um check pieces for fast work we start to look at we've moved on from the dear old three ring bag goodness me hang on i've got everything caught up here there we go um we start to look at what is i guess the modern equivalent to the three ring gag which is a universal so it has a purchase above the, um, and this comes in a couple of different types because bombers do one that has what they call a Williams mouthpiece um, where the connection is in the middle here, which just gives it a little bit faster action. Um, so when it, the beauty of these is you can bit them up and down as you need. So if we want it just to act largely like a loose ring bit, we put the rein on the, um, on the large ring. If we want it to have maximum pressure, we put the rein on the lower ring, which means that it applies pole pressure, but it is stops. Unlike the Cheltenham gags and the proper running gags, once the pressure reaches here, it can't apply any more pressure. My preference with these is to go halfway between and put the equalizers on, which just means that you've still got the same range of pressure but the action of the bit is slowed down a little. These don't have um, chin straps or um, chains because the purchase which is what it is above the cheek piece sits a little high. You can look at getting a chin strap that sits there but again it's kind of next level. Um, these are a really lovely style of bit and again they come in different mouthpieces so this is just a fairly standard transangle lozenge mouthpiece but you can get mouthpieces in that um, that apply different pressures will apply um, more or less tongue pressure more or less bar pressure um, so you know for horses that are tongue reactive you can still have the pole pressure but a mouthpiece that doesn't apply tongue pressure for horses that are stronger again you can put something um, that applies more bar pressure with these cheek pieces so the beauty with a lot of these cheek pieces um, from manufacturers like bombers and newer shuler and trust etc are that each mouthpiece comes in all the available cheek pieces so you can mix and match the bitting as as you require so obviously the other option so this is this sort of thing is for a horse that wants to flip its head coming into a fence I would consider a pelham for um I've only got nitty bitty one somewhere here uh, where is it? um uh, oops, no. pelham has gone missing in action there we go a pelham for a horse that is um wanting to dive down after the jump because the chin pressure should help them lift lift their head um, obviously as you then look through to the higher level combinations again particularly in dressage you will be looking at a bit and bradoon um, in terms of a, a snaffle bit as the bradoon and the weymouth um, so something like this um, for those higher level dressage horses. Now, obviously this is also acceptable in showing, which is another one of my little bugbears because I, you know, there are only, I, I feel like a lot of horses are bitted up into a double combination without perhaps the right training musculature and understanding of that bit for the show ring. Um, that's just me. <laughs> please don't shoot me. Um, I, I much prefer to see horses working well in the show ring in a, in a nice snaffle. Um, so 
obviously, um, look, there's there's a lot to it, and I'm happy to open it up for questions soonish um, to see what else you would like to know. Um, but you know, my 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 priority is to ensure that a horse is bitted safely for the combination comfortably for the horse and that there's some understanding for the um, person riding it about why we've bitted it the way we have. A lot of the generic bits around are, um, a lot of the problems with them is that the joints in, within the lozenge are really large. And again, we, I spoke about noise earlier um, and movement in the mouth is effectively noise. Um, I, and again, you look at this, I mean, this is an older style generic bit, but you know, the lozenge is huge. So as a, you know, these joints here that are also huge would be sitting on the bars of most horses. Um, these better made bits, um, I mean, this is a, what size is it? I don't have my glasses on. I think it's a nine and a half, it's nine and a half centimeter pelham. If you put this next to this brand's 11 and a half centimetre pelum, everything would be is scaled down. So this trust pony range is actually beautiful because they've got teeny tiny joints, teeny tiny lozenges for little mouths, you know, those little Welsh A's and B's and riding ponies. There's not much room in there. So we want, you know, little joints that um, and small lozenges well, in, in relation to the bit size. Um, you know, I think this is probably a five inch bit. And if you look at it compared to something like this, that's the same size, um, the mouthpiece is the same size. You know, you can see how it's just completely different um, in terms of how it sits in the bit and the width, um, the diameter of the bit and the size of the lozenge and the size of the joints. Um, and that's all about making the horse's mouth as comfortable as we can. So it's all about their comfort um, so that we can have a better communication tool to, um, with them. The other thing I am often, I have people surprised by is when I do a measure on their horse's mouth, invariably a bit that is in there is too large. Um, and people are, I mean, it's, uh, I'm bitting, 16 one hand warm bloods that are going in four and a half inch bits genuinely they, that's what they measure um, with a fixed string bit we want that bit to fit really snugly against the corner of the horse's mouths because we don't want any lateral movement going across the tongue um, in a loose ring bit we only want one to three millimetre either side. All of these well-made bits have, um, you probably can't see it, but they're all beveled around here so that it can't catch. Um, obviously when you're doing fast work where a horse is really sweaty or there's a lot of movement because you are going fast across country and show jumping, etc., you quite often want to pop some bit guards on just to protect the horse's face where there's a lot of movement and sweat. But for your dressage work, you know, you, you're unlikely to be using, um, the bit is not going to be acting enough to, to rub the horse's face. Some horses with pink skin as well often need bit guards. Obviously they're not um, legal for dressage, but I often recommend clients to use them at home and just pop them off for competition day with those horses with pink skin or big fat lips where it's going to rub just because of the way the horse is. So look, thank you very much for watching and thank you um, for Pony Club Australia for inviting me to present and indeed inviting me to have input onto the new rules. Um, it's been a pleasure to be working with them and I've really enjoyed enjoying, enjoyed sharing my knowledge with them and, and with you. As I said, I'm more than happy to um, take questions now or if people would like to um, message me directly, that's completely fine also. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so um, our chat function is working. So I'll read out the questions that might be the best because then you don't have to keep track of them. And I guess I was going to ask this question a bit too, that... Um, this question is, do you recommend a fitter in South Australia? And I guess my broader question is, 
how do people go about finding a bit fitter and is there a, a way for people to know that someone is an appropriately trained bit fitter? Um, I have done my training through BitBank Australia and the um, we on their website they have a list of bit fitters for each state so you can be guaranteed that they have done um, we've all done that same training and many of us have done um, extra training also I'm about to do another Nuishul class which I've been warned I need to have a degree in algebra and potentially engineering to be able to get through but we'll see how we go um, I want to fit the bits not necessarily make them but I'm sure I'm going to learn lots and lots through that um, so yes we've all had a base level of education and the other thing we have also is a um, we run a group where we talk amongst ourselves and we have lots of you know if we run into problems we go hey has anyone seen this so there's a really good brains trust there that we can rely on each other for and Sha May who owns Bitbank is fantastic at, at making sure we're all supported in there. Uh, the next one is what do you recommend for young horses? Young horses, I tend to definitely recommend something that's a fixed cheek piece first up, just so that um, young horses and, and horses that have just been started are not balanced over their own forelegs, um, let alone carrying someone on top. So I always recommend certainly putting them in a fixed ring. What sort of mouthpiece they go in is a little bit dependent on, you know, the size of their tongue, how reactive their tongue is, how reactive their bar is, their bars are. So that's a little bit more of a tricky question. And often those young horses, particularly if they're reasonably, you know, the young warm bloods as an example, um, they come through pretty quick and find their balance and then they sort of fairly quickly maybe depending on the level of riding and the level of rider on them will often move through to a loose ring in three to six months but I always recommend something fixed often a D just to help with some of that steering um, some of those steering issues also okay next one does the old fitting rule of a thumb or one finger either side not apply anymore it sure doesn't. <laughs> so with a fixed ring bit, we want it to sit nice and snug because we don't want lateral movement. So a fixed ring bit, particularly like a D, the cheek piece of the bit forms part of the action of the bit. So if we pick up this rein, we want this cheek piece to be sitting there right away ready to press gently on the horse's face. We don't want it to slide for a centimetre before that occurs, which then creates, again, that noise in the horse's mouth. Okay. Um, how can we measure the mouth of our horse to check for the correct size? So I come round with a mouth um, measuring tool which obviously not everyone has um, and that's a one person operation you can do um, we have a I think it's free actually on the BitBank page we have a free measuring tool that we can post out to you um, I haven't actually used one of those because I've always had the bombers measurer um, but if you want a bit more of a two person operation just because you need more than two hands often you can just do the old measurement with baling twine and pop some baling twine on either side and, and you know, kind of feel it there and there and then run a measuring tape across it. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit old fashioned, but it kind of gets the job done. All right. What's the difference between the mouthpieces with lozenges and those without? Um, the mouthpiece with a lozenge, so this little guy means that that pressure is distributed over a broader area of the mouth. So when you look at a single joint bit, and just as a guide, I have one in my kit, and let's see if I can lay my hands on it. Somewhere. A single joint puts... 
with sound effects. A single joint puts a single point of pressure on the horse's tongue. Now, as I said, I have one single joint bit in my kit and I have a couple of others that appear like a single joint bit but um, operate in a slightly different way. I can just find that. Ah, there we go. We're fighting. So a single joint puts a direct pressure on the horse's tongue. Not a lot of horses like that pressure because they can't move it. And it's kind of a bit of a difference between someone doing that to you and someone doing that to you. Um, it also means that it closes up a little bit and it means that there can be more pressure on horses' bars, whereas this spreads the pressure across a larger area of the tongue and it doesn't close up as much as something like this can. That's a very basic. The single joint bit thing is, is um, there's a lot to it. The other thing we have is things like this that offer tongue relief, which is a ported barrel. Um, so that's a different kind of lozenge again, and it gets it, it comes up and off, and that has a lozenge, but you can see that it closes up, it's less movement, but it gives you the opportunity to use each side of the bit independently still. Okay. We might have sort of covered the next question, which was a little bit more about the different action of different mouthpieces. So a port mouth straight, single double joint, and what part of the mouth, tongue and bars they impact. So do you have anything else you'd like to add there? Or yeah, you think so, that? you know, this, this sort of thing is a fairly uniform pressure across the across the lip, tongue and bars. Something like this, um, the ported, this is the bomber's ported barrel. It has very little tongue pressure, but they do have to be able to tolerate some bar pressure just because of the way it sits. The other one which people may be familiar with is the newer Shul Turtle Top, which is a game changer for a lot of the off the track thoroughbreds. And again, that appears largely like a single uh, double jointed bit but you can see how flat the lozenge is compared to their um, transangle lozenge and what the trick to the turtle top is that it actually has it operates like a normal three-piece bit but it locks this way so it can't create any downward pressure on the tongue so no downward tongue tongue pressure, some bar pressure and lip pressure. The next one up in that range is the mouthpiece called a turtle tactio, which you can see is different again. And again, it locks, it gives no tongue pressure, very little bar pressure. So just lip pressure, it's very, very light bit. Um, the other ones we have are things like the, um, bring it, in, but there's the bomber's mouthpiece that is the um, like this, the happy mouth that is just one piece. And again, this gives a huge um, channel for tongue relief, um, but has some bar pressure. And that comes in a variety. This is the nylon, but it comes in the sweet iron also. So there's a whole lot, and all of these manufacturers, you can mix and match it with the mouthpiece and cheek piece, which makes it much easier. All right, here's a specific one. What would you recommend for a low level eventer hoping to move up the grades on their off the track thoroughbred? So the off the track thoroughbreds, as look, and I'm speaking very generally, um, they tend to like some tongue relief. So if they're off the track, we, we, I, my go-to is usually the turtle top. And I just saw a question pop up saying, why is that a godsend for the off the track thoroughbreds? Um, it's because they don't like that hinging of the bit down on the tongue. So this sits really still, but you've still got clear communication with them. Um, Look, I tend to start with the turtle top for off the trackers, depending how far, how long off the track they are, or looking at the um, 
the something like the trans angle lozenge or the team up which only comes in the loose ring so again it'd have to be a little bit more established but um yeah look it obviously depends on a whole lot of other things in terms of how strong it is what levels that it's working whether there's a big difference in the horse when it's jumping and flat work and and all of those variables that come into a decision of, of what you pop in their mouth. Um, there's a couple of questions about how can we get more of Fiona. Um, so there's, um, <laughs> will you do education sessions at pony clubs? Well, Fiona does do sessions in pony clubs in Victoria, but perhaps we can um, help out people who are in other states to find somebody like Fiona to come and do a session at your club. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, most of um, um, our fitters are happy to do that. So, um, yeah, we can absolutely help you out. Yeah, okay. Um, so the concept that the larger the circumference, circumference, the larger the surface area, the less severe on the mouth is a fallacy. Look, I think, um, look, I think it, it is now because it just, the bigger ones just, don't fit now again there are outliers to, to all of those things I think what we need is something that fits in the interdental space um, and that is appropriate for, for that horse's mouth so some horses do like bits that have a little a little bit huh, more to them but you know things like my old friend here the canoe you know manufacturers just don't make them that thick anymore um the trust bits you know get uh are quite um wide at at the lip these days but even then you can see this it tapers through to the middle of the mouthpiece so it is quite shaped it's not just a uniform diameter across there um so you know that the as i said earlier the gentlest bit is the one that's well fitted for your horse um, you know, I'm certainly not advocating, you know, a piece of barbed wire is a good thing because it's nice and fine and it's not thick. But, you know, the big old canoes that we've got around and, and quite often, you know, they're, they're heavy. I mean, this canoe is not super heavy because it's hollow. This canoe is really heavy. Um, you know, that's probably the heaviest bit I've got in the kit um, and it's just there for show. Um, so, you know, it's, it's in the most sensitive part of their body. Um, you know, we, we want them to be comfortable so that they can do the best work that we ask them to do for us. What are the mullen bits that are straight with no joins? That's things like this. Um, again, the, the flexi softs. Um, the mullen mouth is not super. Most of our things that you would call a mullen in terms of something with no join have a huge amount of shape to them now so the mullens of old were literally just a straight piece but you know our things with our bits with no joint have either shape in them or flexible movement in them um, there's also a lovely um bombers bit also which works really i mean this is even um, the material is even less robust than the trust one, but this is really lovely for, you know, certain types of horses. There are certain horses that you pop this in and they love. Um, I do the bitting at um, um, Living Legends, and it's safe to say that our friend who shot the barman did not like this bit. It still has his teeth marks in it. So I treat it as a souvenir. But, you know, that I mean, and that's another point. As bit fitters, we can take all of our learning and observe the horse work in his normal bit and, and put our hands in his mouth and go, okay, I'm pretty sure this is going to be it. And at the end of the day, even though we've, we've chosen what we think is going to be a good bit, he can still just go, yeah, no, don't like that. Um, and you put another one in there, he's like, yeah, I like that. So even bits that may be, you know, similar, they, they still just... Um, <coughs> You know, it ultimately comes down to what the horse likes. Um, why is the turtle bit a good one for off the tracks? As I said earlier, the turtle top um, has no downward tongue pressure. 
and they really like it. Um, that's combined with the egg butt or the D. You've got a couple of choices of mouthpieces, just mean it's really stable. It just sits there and leaves them alone largely. And particularly, you know, it might not be the bit they stay in, but certainly in that transition um, when they've been fussy from, you know, I, I don't want to bag the racing industry because I, I work in the racing industry as well, but often um, the thoroughbreds haven't been particularly well bitted and then they've also been trained to lean on, on jockey's hands um, as part of their training. And then they've often been run with, run with a tongue tie also. So they're fairly sensitive about what goes in their mouth. Um, so it just sits there really nicely. There's very, very little movement in the lozenge, but as a rider, you still have the ability to apply bar pressure and have movement and affect each side of the bit, um, but it doesn't hinge down. So it's very still and, and they, just, they just love it. I couldn't bit off the track thoroughbreds without out this. <laughs> I love it. I'd be very sad if they all, if they all disappeared. <laughs> What are the pros and cons of a drop cheek? Um, actually, that's a good point. I didn't mention our friend, the Bowsher. Um, the Bowsher has had a bit of a, um, a bit of a checkered history. Um, initially, and I'm sure many of you will remember that the Bowsher or the drop cheek was not allowed um, because the perception was that it exerted pole pressure because it has what we call a purchase, which is above the mouthpiece. So, um, you know, this is the purchase on a Weymouth. This is the purchase, purchase on, a way, on a voucher. The only way this can exert pole pressure is if there's a fixed piece below the purchase, a fixed point either inside or outside of the cheek piece. So I've got so many bits here. Um, so a fixed piece like the universal something there or inside like the little Wilkies. Um, in fact, when you see these in action, you'll see that they actually exert, and you can see that the purchase is swept away from the cheeks there. They exert, they give pole relief. So you'll see the cheek pieces on the bridle become a little bit saggy or soft. Um, the um, benefits of this is that it holds the mouthpiece very still, um, similar to a D, probably a little more stable than a D. And you've also got that, feel of a little bit of a full cheek in terms of it helps with turning for a horse that might be a bit objectionable about that. Really nice um, choice for some strong um, ponies that get, you know, directionally um, obsessed, shall we say, um, with, with itty bitty riders on them. Okay. Um, I have an off the track thoroughbred that's head tossing. He's in a straight bar truss I've tried a simple snaffle and a turtle top and he's still tossing his head. Um, he needs a bit of fish. <laughs> it's really hard with, with um, examples like that to sort of go, oh, this one will fix it. Um, yeah, look, it could be a lot of things. It could be, um, uh, I mean, the other thing I should have mentioned is that obviously your dental work needs to be up to date all the time. So it could be that he has some dentition issues going on. Um, it could be that he needs a change in cheek, pa cheek piece to help it be stable because obviously if he's doing that, he's not balanced over four feet and he's not helping you be balanced sitting on his back. You know, you can have the most stable hands in the world if a horse is bouncing you around, it's really hard to keep soft and still. Um, so yeah, there, there may be a, a lot of things. I wish I had the silver bullet for you, but it, it's probably a lot of different things. But if you wanted to shoot me through some video, I can give you um, give you a hand or point you in the right direction with someone who can help you for sure. Okay, well, um, that person, I've got your name here and um, Beck, you can send me an email if you like and we'll put you in touch with Fiona. Um, can a novice owner tell if their horse has 
thin or fat lips or a thin or a fat tongue? How do they tell? Yeah, often um, for a novice owner, it's a really cool thing I usually do when I go to pony clubs is we get three or four horses lined up um, and I get people to put, we make sure they're nice horses, I'm not going to eat anyone's head, um, and get people to put their fingers in the mouth and, and feel that. Um, obviously, certain breeds lend themselves to having fatter tongues and, and um, chubbier, you know, more flesh around the lips, the, the native breeds, um, Welsh um you know whalers quarter horses those sorts of horses tend to be and obviously you know the thoroughbreds and riding ponies and the arabians would would be ones we would you know consider having um you know finer facial features so you know have a look at um three or four horses and take i mean we've got these phones now take take photos and, and compare them um you can pop your finger in and just have a feel around and see, and, and you'll you'll soon start to see that each horse is really, really different. Um, you know, some horses you can put your finger on the tongue and they're happy with it. Others, you know, the, the tongue becomes like a writhing snake. Um, and so, yeah, it's really just a matter of just exploring and, and getting to, to learn yourself. Thank you. Um, what about the rollers on a mouthpiece? Um, are you talking about the ones in the ported barrels or so ported barrels and the milers um, have what we call a roller instead of a, a lozenge um, and what they mean is that those types of bits will lock up in the horse's mouth so they stay incredibly still but you still have left and um, well, right and left movement without affecting the other side um, so there's a huge amount of stability in there um, if you're talking about the bits the old-fashioned bits um, with rollers all the way along the mouthpiece I've look I'm not a massive fan of that and the same with the uh, I've hidden this while I've been holding this bit up, but this is a very old fashioned bit, but the same with the keys, like that's an old fashioned mouthing bit. Um, my, and, and people sort of look at these and go, oh, but you know, it gives him something to play with. Look, to be brutally honest, if my bum's going in that saddle, I don't want the horse playing with something. I want their attention and focus to be on me. Um, and look, I get that might not be a super popular view, but um, you know, I, I like that that stability. I think if a horse needs the rollers, if they're that fussy, I think we can bit them better, to be honest. Okay. An egg butt versus a D-ring. So a D-ring gives you a little bit more stability in the mouthpiece than the egg butt. And I think the D rings. There goes my pepper shaker. Um, the D's um, are a more elegant design than the old um, tom thumbs or full cheeks because they're safer. They can't get caught in stuff. Um, so, and they help, you know, anything above this or below this, if you need anything, you know, that high or that low to help you turn, then again, I, I kind of think it goes back to being a training issue, to be honest. I really like the Ds um, and keep the mouthpiece nice and stable and really help, particularly for um, horses that might need a little assistance turning, jumping as well. They're a really nice cheek piece. Egg butts come in a huge range of styles and shapes across manufacturers. So some egg butts can look more like D's um, and some are quite, I mean, obviously, egg butt, you know, this is a Bradoon, this one's a Bradoon egg butt, so the smaller ones versus the, the 70 mil size. So again, the egg butts come in a whole lot of different um, sizes, depending on the brand. Some egg butts really do look like D rings. Um, okay, show us your favourite. Can you show us your favourite go-to bit in your collection for general riding? Um, 
I've probably got a couple at the moment. I, I do like the bits with, with tongue relief, and that's mainly because the horses I'm riding are seeking some tongue relief in the standard breads generally want some so you know my bestie the turtle top um or the ported the bombers ported barrel um trust have recently released a really beautiful range of pony bits and you know they've really got it that, that our little friends have little mouths um i've not had a horse that i've put one of these in that hasn't liked it so they're lovely and they come in loose ring egg but boucher um pelhams um, they're just a really lovely, lovely bit. So, look, I'm like a kid in a lolly shop. My parents recently stayed and um, I think they were quite horrified at the amount of bits. But, um, you know, you, you've kind of, as, as a fitter, I've got to have each cheek piece and mouthpiece combination and then have them in all the different sizes. Um, so it does end up being quite the collection. Um, but no, I do, I, I do really like the newer shawl bits and, and any of these newer manufacturers, you know, newer shawl and bombers, um, Trust and um, Springer, you know, they're all doing huge amounts of research into it, which is fascinating as well. So they're genuinely trying to make it, you know, make bits better for our, for our horses' mouths. Uh, my horse's bit has lots of chew marks on it. And he came with that bit. Would you recommend getting a different one? It's a loose riding snaffle double jointed, maybe yeah. a loose ring. Um, doing loose ring. great uh, three and four. Yeah, look, he may be seeking something different. Um, you know, if the chewing is, if you're just noticing the marks but not feeling, you know, that he's gnawing on the bit then that's different to if you're feeling that he's gnawing on the bit. Obviously, if he's gnawing on the bit, that's that's going to be affecting your contact, um, his connection and his bit acceptance, which, you know, is going to be start, as you move up those levels, it's going to start to be picked up by judges because they're going to put a greater reliance on um, those coefficients around um, submission and acceptance. So, you know, possibly there is a better mouthpiece mouthpiece for him. Um, how can you tell if a horse has a small mouth or a low palate? So a low palate is another one of those things that's a little bit of a myth. Um, a low palate is generally confused with a horse having a big tongue. Um, most of the palates I see are concave and not flat and actually a good friend of mine um, has lots and lots of horses and donkeys so she um, pulls in she has um, Shannon Lee the equine dentist come each year for a day so I usually go out and hang out with Shannon and annoy him most of the day with questions um, one of the things he brought up about that is because horses molars constantly erupt when they're very young and when they're very old, it can appear that there's less of an interdental space and appear more like a low palate because the molars haven't fully erupted. And obviously when they're, very, when they're young, um, they're still erupting and that's where you see the tooth bumps along the bottom of horses, particularly in the Arabians and riding ponies and those finer types of breeds. Um, and he tended to agree with me that a low palate was actually probably a, um, a definite outlier rather than a regular, regular thing. It is more that there's um, a small interdental space and a big, big tongue. That said, again, you should be, you know, bitting for, for the, the space that's, that's there, obviously. Okay. Um, so uh, my horse went to the dentist uh, six months ago. But recently he pulls down at the bit at the walk and he seems uncomfortable. So back to the dentist or a different bit? Um, if the dentist didn't find anything unusual or any anomalies in the horse's mouth, um, I'd first check in that it's not a training issue. 
um, and make sure that your coach, you know, that is the horse, you know, obviously the things you want to tick off are, are saddle fit body work. Is the horse comfortable? Um, is it a training issue? But then absolutely it could be that the bit needs to be changed. Um, obviously it's, you know, the bit is one part of this whole puzzle. It's, you know, I often say that if I could, if I had the bit that fixed all your training issues, I wouldn't be schlepping around countryside Victoria in the winter. Um, I'd be sitting behind, beside a pool somewhere nice and warm. But, you know, it, it does have to work in conjunction with, with trainer and your coach. And quite often, particularly for horses going into double bridles first time, I will ask that the coach is there for the fitting um, so that I have their eyes on the ground also because they know the combination way better than I do. Um, on a on a bit fitting appointment, and it's very important to get that change correct. Um, what suggestions do you have for horses with a parrot mouth? Parrot mouth's not a massive issue. Um, obviously, we need to make sure they're regularly visiting their dentist. Um, but I don't bit horses up um, any differently. Um, I've done a lot of parrot mouths, and often. Sometimes you, you don't actually see them until you open, you lift up the lips. And I, I actually have a joke with a friend where I go, oh, I saw a Franken horse today. And the owners are generally really lovely and, and let me take a photo. But, you know, there are horses that you open the mouth and just go, wow, like there's either a big parrot mouth or there are, you know, only two incisors on the front row and, you know, all of that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, you see, you see some sights. And sometimes owners go oh wow I'd never noticed that and I'll go oh, I probably need to call your dentist I reckon but you know I on my pre set on my pre-appointment form I do ask when the last time a horse has seen a dentist is and if they haven't seen it within the last 12 months I suggest they have a dental visit before I come out um, to ensure that there's nothing going on there but parrot mouth I, I bit you know like like any other horse because it's generally not not a not a bit in concern. How long should you trial a new bit before you know it's the right one? Um, I ask riders to, if, if they have only seen a 5% change when I change a bit, I don't think that's good enough. I can't ask people to put their hand in the pocket and buy a bit. Um, I look for about a 20% change and then I advise that you want to, you will continue to see probably over about a dozen rides a bit of an improvement as the horse gains confidence in the new mouthpiece and cheek piece. Um, if you haven't seen a huge difference initially, I'd kind of say it's a bit of a hard no from the horse. Um, but that said, again, working with your trainer um, to, to see what's going on and making sure the bid is appropriate for the level that you're at. Okay, um, what do you think about Waterford snaffles and how do they act on the horse's mouth? Waterford, let me grab a Waterford. Waterford is not the evil, scary thing that we have been led to believe. Um, so a Waterford acts um, like it, it's, it all moves, okay? So obviously a well-made Waterford is all rounded. There's nothing that's going to catch in the horse's mouth. For a very, very heavy horse who wants to lean, um, it's an option for, for your fast work. It's obviously not dressage legal um, because there's nothing for them to lean on. Um, I have a couple of harness racing horses going around in a Waterford that wanted to tow people hot laps of racetracks that has been incredibly affected, effective. That said, it is absolutely not a bit for a junior rider. It is not a bit for a combination that is not advanced. Um, I have, apart from the race horses, I have fitted one bit one Waterford bit to a pony club rider and I don't think they're legal anymore from memory I think they're an exemption bit but she was riding level one she was highly capable 
um, and she was, you know, probably 50 kilos ringing wet and on a very large 17, 1, 17, 2 hand warm blood that just wanted to go, I reckon we'll go this fast into the jump. And she needed something that said, I think we need to go this fast into the jump, mate. So it is absolutely not a not a go-to bit. It's a special circumstances bit, but it is not, you know, it really is designed so that there's nothing there for the horse to lean on. Mm -hmm. um, oh, bits for horses that suck their tongue back and put their tongue over the bit. Yes, so... Again, we go back to my friend, the turtle top and things like the ported barrel. So generally the reason why they're sucking their tongue back is they don't like pressure on the tongue. So if we can take the pressure away from the tongue, it then just hangs out there. And again, with my standard breads, I, these are the two bits I go to first. They'll either like one or the other. Um, the, the turtle top just lays across the tongue. The ported barrel actually gets up and off, off the tongue. Um, the happy tongue, happy mouth also, um, that mouthpiece from Bombers is also very effective. Um, but it does get, some people find it a little bit dull because they can't move um, what we'd call the bit cannons or the bit arms. There's no side to side movement. It's very, um, you know, for horses that want to lean, this wouldn't be a great choice because they can just lean on it because there's no movement to unlock their jaw. Um, okay, uh, we have a lot of people wanting to use the three ring gag bits for camp drafting and we only permit snapple bits. So what bit could we suggest for them to use um, that would help them with their control? Um, but be uh, legal. Um, are they, and I'm going to throw back to you, Catherine, are they allowed to use the universal check piece? Do mm -hmm. you know? That would be my first option. This is mm -hmm. really the modern equivalent of the three ring gag. So this is called a two and a half ring gag. I grew up hunting. If you turned up to our hunt with a three ring gag with the rain on the third ring, you were sent back to the to your car and float and told to change it, to put equalizers on um, or move, move the rain. And I tell you what, in you know 1984, you did what the hunt master told you. Um, so yes, the, the universal would be the option. Um, again, I'm I, can't exactly remember. The other option could potentially be um, a Pelham, but um, again, I'd have to double check what's legal for that um, that section on the Pony Club rules. Um, we'll let Diane maybe have a um, chat then. Where are you, yeah. Diane? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm not on uh, video. Uh, That's right. Okay, there. Yeah, uh, well, basically it's only the snapple bits that we're allowed, we're permitted in, in the camp drafting and a few of those other type ones where it's quite a, well, I presume you need a lot of control in it, um, but we only allow a snapple, but we're getting a lot of people coming through asking for exemptions for the three ring gag. And I was just thinking, is there any um, other bit? I know we, we're permitting the Wilkie now in games, whether the Wilkie would be a, an option instead of, would that give a bit more control, do you think, that we could maybe put that in as a legal bit next year? Yeah, the Wilkie gives, I'm just trying to find a Wilkie, sorry. Um, the Wilkie gives you that little bit of leverage. Um, so the Wilkie gives leverage because the fixed points are within the cheek piece, um, not outside like the um, Dutch gag or the universal. Um, and I'd meant to mention it in there, the Wilkie is um, rally legal, I believe. And it's yeah. a really great option for um, tiny top kids on strong, grumpy old ponies who, again, might need to go places that the child doesn't want to go. And it just gives them that tiny bit of leverage, you know, when they're a little 20 kilo dot up yeah. there on a 
Shetland that's determined. Um, so there's that option. The other option is to increase the strength of the mouthpiece, mm. um, things like this, like the um, verbindend mouthpiece. The bit cannon has quite a large um, curve in it, which means it applies more bar pressure. Um, and in dressage, we tend to use that to create a lift through the shoulder as a horse progresses through um, dressage. However, it, it may, it, it does pack a little bit more of a punch. Um, so that may be another option. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, we might just need to have a chat, chat what we can sort of think of to make legal for next yeah. year for these one, these ones. Yeah, sure. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and what type of bit would you suggest for pony breakers? I'm assuming this means people breaking in ponies. <clears throat> so the pony, um, the, that trust pony range is lovely. Obviously with ponies, the most important thing is, is that the, um, the bit fits. So in the generic ranges of bits, what you will generally find is that the bit cannons, so the bit arms, are cut down. So a five inch bit, the lozenge and the cheek piece will be the same. Um, sorry, the four and a half inch or four inch bit, everything will be the same, but the cannons will be shorter. So it makes it a bit uncomfortable for the pony. With um, this trust range and obviously the Noah shawl and the bombers, everything's scaled. So you know, a nice little, um, you know, this little trust um, egg butt, um, really nice starting bit for the ponies. Um, everything small, obviously, you know, needs to be measured up to, to check. Um, no sure for reasons passing understanding, only go down to a four and a half inch in their egg butt check piece for ponies. So we have put in a request that they, they consider going down. Everything else for the ponies is in a loose ring. Um, we've asked for them to make small of that, but then our friends Trust did this, so we're very happy. Thank you. We've got to the end of all the questions and it's nearly at nine oh, o'clock wow. on Eastern time. So um, I think that there's nothing more to say than thank you so much for being so generous with your time and so helpful to everyone. Oh. Um, and any people that have any questions that they'd like to, um, would you like them to be able to send them to you directly or will we? Yeah, sure. Look, I'm at, you? You know, yeah, I'm at um, Bitright Equine Facebook page. And look, obviously these are, you know, there are a whole lot of, um, you know, different ways of doing the right thing as with everything in horses. So, you know, I've, I've shared my knowledge, but there are others out there who know more or who may think think differently and, and that's all good too. But yeah, bit right equine people can get hold of me on. Um, I'm generally in of an evening. I'm usually out most of the day. So don't panic if I don't get back to you right away. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Oh, look, I just saw Sarah Sawicki there. She's around the corner from where my horses live, I think. <laughs> like literally over the road. <laughs> Um, so for those, who are for those who are still on the line, um, Pony Club Australia is very interested to continue to have a, a series of educational uh, sessions on topics of interest. We've already organised the next one for August. Um, we'll let you know the date very soon, but we have a couple of speakers who'll be talking on inclusive coaching, so coaching techniques for people with... Um, with different abilities. So we're very much looking forward to having that session in next month. So by all means, um, happy to take suggestions for other topics for future things and to run these at least monthly and maybe more frequently if people are interested. So for those who didn't get to see the whole session, we'll um, put it up on our YouTube channel at some time, probably early next week. And um, uh, that's it. So thanks very much, Fiona, and have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye.